Hello, in this podcast we are going to be looking at asexual reproduction and by the end of this podcast we'll understand the different kinds of asexual reproduction. What I want you to do for this podcast is a little different from before. In this one I'm giving you the questions now instead of at the end. So while we're watching this, and we're going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the different types of asexual reproduction and you'll see videos where you'll see it actually occurring and you can make a table or just a series of notes and for each one I want you to put down the type of asexual reproduction you can describe it or you can sketch it and put down how many parents the offspring has and then at the end I'd like you to pause it and just ask yourself self what do all these types of asexual reproduction have in common and that common theme will tell us what we really need something we really need to know really need to know about this and then la and then later we're going to compare it with sexual reproduction one thing we're not doing in this podcast is we're not looking at reproduction of the cells themselves if we're not looking at mitosis that we're going to do in another podcast first we're going to look at runners and strawberries are the example right now i've got one here i hope you can see there's a big one there the plants under the nasturtium somewhere they seem to have taken over a bit but there's one there and we can can you see there's a nice little root system on the bottom of that and then off of that one there's another one okay which has actually got very very small roots on now i'll show you both with this one okay so the first one what I'll do is I'll plant this one in the soil because there are spaces around this bed and it won't get too congested. So all you need to do is just dig a little hole. I mean, sometimes if you miss them out and you don't realise that there are any there, they'll just root themselves and you'll suddenly have a new plant growing. Okay, but if they have only just started to root themselves, you can actually lift them up and move them. So if we pop it in his little hole, push the soil around that. Okay, oh look, there's a weed. And then the other one, what we'll do is I'll show you how to continue growing it in a pot. Now you might actually get another one off of this. When this starts to get a decent root system on it, you'll, you may well get another one. Now it's up to you what you want to do with that one. If you just want two, uh, then that's fine. So get your pot, a three inch pot, Okay, fill it with soil. I've just taken the soil from here, but if you want to use multi-purpose compost, then that's fine. Just make a little divot in the ground. Can you see that? Let me just move this down a little bit. There we go. Okay, just make a little hole in the ground, and then just pop the little strawberry runner in there. Push it down. Be very careful not to break this runner here okay because that's what's feeding it is from the parent plant so if we just put it there we might need to put a little stone on top to stop it from popping out okay and it's quite loose here the runner is quite loose okay so that's the two ways of doing it and they're well established then you can cut that joining runner off to separate them out and then they'll be quite happy on their own Here's the first example of binary fission, and this is in a prokaryote in bacteria. Prokaryotes, remember, are organisms which don't have a nucleus. Bacteria reproduce very simply and rapidly by doubling their contents and splitting in two. Just one bacterium, dividing every 20 minutes, could produce nearly 5,000 billion billion bacteria in one day. Now we're going to look at binary fission in a eukaryote in a single-celled organism called a paramecium.
In binary fission, we saw that the cells basically split into two equal parts. Now we're going to look at budding where they start, where it's unequal parts, where they bud out, and that we're going to see in yeast, which is a single-celled fungus. fungus. Now we're looking at budding in an animal, in hydra. Hydras are related to jellyfish and to corals, and you'll see them, but and you see the offspring budding out of uh, the adult. Budding can be a rapid form of reproduction. Two days after feeding, this individual has produced two buds. Twenty-four hours later, the buds have developed tentacles. They are rapidly becoming small replicas derived from their parents' tissue. Two days later, the new individuals have broken free and looped to new feeding stations beyond the sweep of their parents' feeding tentacles. In two weeks, the hydra population has exploded. Next one we're looking at is called vegetative propagation where the offspring literally grows out of the parent and we're going to see this in potatoes. Hi, I'm Tim McWelch of Earth Connection School of Wilderness Survival and Ancient Skills near Fredericksburg, Virginia. This is our video series on organic gardening. In this clip we're going to show you how to use some other methods of propagating plants. First I want to show you what to do with the nasty bag of potatoes you found at the bottom of your cabinet. These are sprouting and turning green because they've had some sunlight on them. Each one of these clusters of little plants is a little potato plant. Potatoes are obviously the root crop of the potato plant, but we can't make potatoes without the plants. So we take these disgusting green knobby things and we can place them in a container with about six inches of soil in the bottom and just simply place them in there. We could cut them and try to divide them, but typically one of these clusters will take over and become dominant. Possibly two or even three may become dominant and all of the rest will just stay as they are. And this potato will use up the carbohydrates stored inside to produce the plants. This part will shrivel up and rot away and these potato plants will persist. And they will grow up out of the pot. As they grow, they will grow more potatoes down at the roots. So we will take four of these potatoes and place them in about six inches of soil in the bottom of our pot. Now we could add a little bit of organic fertilizer and top it off with a few inches of soil. By burying the potatoes periodically as green growth emerges out of the soil, we stimulate more root production. And more root production on a potato plant means more potatoes for us to eat. So every time our foliage gets six inches or eight inches tall above the soil line, we would simply dump in more dirt and this will end up making more potatoes. That's why we start at the bottom of this barrel. 
Now we come to what you may think generally along the lines of asexual reproduction, and we're looking at it in Komodo dragons in parthenogenesis, and and here you're going to see they're, that they're laying eggs, and this is still asexual, not sexual. Something like a Komodo dragon, or in the past a python or a rattlesnake, it's usually considered to be abnormal. But what we have here, and what we've reported in this paper, is we've got two female Komodo dragons, totally unrelated, one here at London and one at the Chester Zoo, who have both reproduced by this uh, asexual mechanism within the space of a year. And this suggests, of course, that maybe, just maybe, it's much more common and prevalent than we might have previously thought, so we should be looking for it elsewhere. Now here at the end, and this is the same screen we saw before, you should have done the first three things there. And now I'd like you to pause for a moment and answer the question at the end, what do all these examples have in common? And then we get to the next screen and we'll answer that question. So what do they have in common? Well, you've probably noticed that in asexual reproduction, they, all the offspring have only one parent. Unlike in sexual reproduction, which is what we have, where each offspring has two parents. Since they have one parent, all of their genes must come from that one parent, unlike in us, where our genes come from both of our parents, and that's why we resemble both of our parents. So the offspring has to be genetically, is normally genetically identical to the parent, the reason why is that normally sometimes there are some changes like through uh, mutations and those things we're going to learn about when we, when we get into genetics. So the two bullets you see there are the main things that they have in common that you need to know. And I will see you tomorrow in class and we're going to be doing a similar type of thing looking at sexual reproduction in class. <laughs>